Great. Awesome. So welcome, welcome, welcome to the One Seed One Community um, Skillshare. Um, I'm Rebecca Newbert. I'm from the Richmond Grows Seed Lending Library. And um, I am going to talk a little bit about my experience. And then Elizabeth Johnson is going to talk about her experience. For some reason, when I'm talking, I'm not showing up at all. Can you see me at all? I can see you. That's weird. It's not recording. It's not recording me on the thing. Huh, that's super weird. Okay. I see you on the side. Well, okay. Well, I'm not sure. I'm recording and I'm not seeing myself on the side. I'm seeing you on the side. Huh. Okay. So, well, I, you might be, it might be, we might be featuring you in, in full time, Elizabeth. <laughs> no, I'm on the side of mine. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience. Elizabeth's going to talk a little bit about her experience. Then we'll have a little bit of time at the end to, you know, uh, questions, answers. And then I've created a little worksheet to kind of walk us through some of the first steps. And that will kind of guide us as we kind of go through this process. Uh, and once again, this is going to be the idea is that this is not going to be a first run. We're not going to just shove you off into the world and be like, good luck. So we'll have a couple of these kind of ongoing throughout the season to kind of support you as, um, you know, as questions come up and as you go through the process. So just kind of way of introduction. So I am Rebecca Newburn. I am with the Richmond Grows Seed Lending Library. We started in 2010. We've done a number of One Seed One Community projects, you know, and we'll talk about kind of the pitfalls of what worked, what didn't work, what we're kind of thinking about now. And I also do um, do a lot with the seedlibraries.net. So I kind of put together the seedlibraries.net website and uh, that is me, Elizabeth, what about you? And I'm, I'm coming in from the beautiful Ohlone territory, which is uh, currently known or often known as the San Francisco Bay Area. Hi, everybody. Sorry. Sorry, I'm going to read my notes <laughs> because that helps a lot. I'm Elizabeth Johnson. I live in San Luis Obispo on the central coast of California, traditional territory of northern Chumash and traditional coastal ocean territory, now known as the National Chumash Marine Sanctuary. Today, we'll be discussing ways to initiate a community seed project. I'm hoping that you'll find some insight by my story, but please don't think you need 10 years of experience before starting a one year, a one seed, one community project. In 2007, I started a group called so Seed Exchange that became an ever shifting roster of hundreds of seed savers and supporters. As the group facility uh, facilitator for 16 years, I've been the primary organizer for our almost annual community seed exchanges for dozens of educational talks and events, and for presenting slow seed exchange at the annual Santa Barbara Seed Swabs, Greenhouse Growers, Rare Fruit Growers Conference, annual Central Coast Pioneers Conferences, and other more local plant-friendly groups, including our local chapter of the California Native Plant Society, who started their own annual seed swaps after attending ours. Uh, through this participation with other groups, Slow Seed Exchange formed lots of relationships with many people. In 2016, I assisted our county library in setting up seed catalogs in the branch libraries, then led quarterly discussions and activities at those libraries. The library connection became really important. I've been meeting with the California and beyond, a uh, seed library network at the annual Heirloom Expo for 10 years and getting to know the wonderful folks involved with seed and seed libraries, like Rebecca Newman, who chaired these meetings <laughs> and is with us today. I've spent time as a volunteer at Cornell University Organic Wheat Research Farm, participated in organic wheat trials for the University of California Davis, participated in tomato trials with the California Organic Seed Alliance folks, and participated in a three-year California Kidney Bean Collaborative to study genetics of gardener Save Seed. Since 2014, I've designed and led demonstration seed gardener gardens for ecologistics, City Farm Slow educational program, Outside Now educational program, and for our Seed Savers Organic Gardens at our local Guildhall, where many educational talks took place. 
my academic and work background is visual art and design. For my family garden, I'm an experimental gardener, always learning and expanding design skills for seed saving and trying out new varieties, an endless and joyful journey that I love to share with others. Last year, I signed up for a land race gardening tutorial that added another dimension. From small local gardening groups to larger gatherings to seed conferences to our seed library summits, I've learned that each interaction brings new friends, supporters, and potential sponsors in a wide web of community. Of all these activities over the years, the 2019 California One Seed One Community Project remains one of my favorites. I was ready for it and our community was ready for this project. I'm here today to share our process in that. Great. And I just want to remind people before Elizabeth kind of launches into her presentation that this is going to be, you are going to get the recording of this, so you don't feel like you need to be taking lots of notes. We are going to be giving you a worksheet at the end mm -hmm. that will take a little bit of time to kind of go through the first initial steps. And then um, also in the chat, we have Sue Buswell and uh, Kelly Wilson are there. Um, I know Kelly's done the One Seed One Community. So um, feel free to put uh, questions in the chat. We'll probably be answering them towards the end, just because probably a lot of it will be answered during the presentation. Go for it. And then also, if you're seeing it and you see all of the participants, and that's kind of hard for you to kind of focus, once again, you can change the view. If you go to the top of your thing and you click the view, you can do it where you see the speaker and the slides versus, you know, the whole panel of participants, which might be a little bit distracting for you. Go for it. Okay, California One Seed One Community. And, uh, oops, slides. Am I, oh, you want to share me? Oh, share, share, share. We can see I, you. Sharing. You uh, my slides aren't moving. Uh, uh, uh. Down at the bottom, maybe, the little arrow. There we go. Okay, so um, just a reminder to all of you thinking about this this um, project, One Seed, One Community. Kids absolutely love seeds. So try to include seeds wherever you, or kids wherever you can. Um, let's see if that. When you're thinking about organizing a One Seed, One Community project, where do you begin? So look around, see who's already doing seed work in your community. Has somebody organized a similar project? Are there people in your area that you've talked to that are interested in doing a group project? Uh, we start, had our first uh, gardener seed exchange in 2007 and invited a wonderful organic farmer uh, who did a talk on saving heirloom tomato seeds. And this was our first experience uh, gathering sponsors, um, groups that supported us, and uh, Slow Parks and Recreation, the Cal Poly University Sustainable Egg, a local nursery, a local environmental education, and an environmental um, media person, Hope Dance. What are the history of seed saving activities in your community and who was leading them? We started collecting, people started bringing in uh, their family and uh, heirloom seeds. For example, um, I do live in Chuash territory. Someone brought in seeds from a uh, Bavadi squash, Chumash variety, um, and those seeds kind of sat around. We, She made the envelope with the story of where she got the seeds and the history that she knew, and uh, so I reproduced that envelope, and all the seeds since then have been given away in the same envelope she brought in, and seven years later, a young farmer grew out a whole pack, so we had a fresh seeds that are very true to trait and wonderful to give away. Uh, we got recipes, family recipes, stories, uh, fava beans and others. Love the stories. A recent quote by Ira Wallace, our elder seed keeper from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and other groups of the African diaspora. 
If you're going to achieve all the things you want, you have to work with other people. Seed saving is the poster child of interdependence and how that can work well. Here's a picture of the California Seed Librarians meeting in 2019. That was the end of our first year of the One Seed, One Community project. Ah, see Rebecca there right in the middle holding the sign. Um, anyway, great group. Uh, we have participants from Michigan and New York State. Uh, we've over the years we've had um, uh, movie directors uh, come in. Anybody who's doing a movie on seed, they stop by this gathering and let us know what they're doing, and we try to keep in touch with them and get their films out there in our communities. So where did this all come from? This came from one person, Hilly Salo, a master gardener and facilitator for Silicon Valley Grows. She designed and managed this product for three years in Silicon Valley, then described it each year. And during the 2018 Seed Library Summit, um, we talked about it. We finally got really excited about it and decided to try it in California. And uh, we created uh, four regional organizers that were committed to uh, running the project in their regions. And I uh, committed to running in uh, the Central Coast, which included San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties, plus a few others in other places. Uh, Rebecca Hilly and I got together during the uh, EcoFarm conference in a few months later to plan what we were going to do and how to do it. Uh, we created um, uh, an outline. Uh, we talked about growing environments within each of the regions we were going to uh, work in um, and a seed that would succeed in all of them. And so when we went to select a seed to grow as a community, Hilly is a member of the slow food movement. So we looked at the slow food arc of taste listings for a bean that has good flavor, both fresh and dry. We looked for a variety that was endangered um, by not being grown commercially, so possibly going extinct, which um, subsequently I learned that the um, Cherokee tribe, tribal nation actually still grows that seed and they um, sent a packet to Svalbard International Seed Bank recently of the Cherokee Trail of Tears. Um, part of our planning included, very importantly, vision and goals. And our vision and goals were to educate our community to grow a bean from seed to seed, grow one variety as a commitment to the earth and food security, inspire people to fall in love with a seed, and to save our heirloom seeds and share them. Uh, why was it important that we chose a bean for One Seed, One Community? Well, um, I love beans. <laughs> and uh, Beans are self-pollinated. They're very easy to grow for good results. They come in thousands of beautiful colors and size, sizes. They're easy to harvest, easy to clean, easy to store. They're a staple crop full of protein and fiber. They provide nutrients for the soil. They require less resources to thrive. They store well when they're dry and they provide a long-term food, food source. Uh, mostly they're genetically stable uh, thanks to the thousands of years that our indigenous communities have worked with them. And 20 healthy plants will provide uh, genetic preservation for each of the species of common beans. Um, when you multiply that by a whole community growing 20 plants each, those beans are super strong, very resilient, hopefully, and able to confront challenges of climate change and provide local food security. Hilly Salo, who is the master gardener, um, offered to create an educational guide with monthly notes about growing the beans that all four participating regions received uh, via our four different listservs. 
Uh, this was really super important. Those tutorials were a really great bonding and cohesive element of the project. We created common graphics and text and story. We all used uh, the same basic graphics for the posters, for the envelopes, and for the sign-up sheets that we used. Um, here in the Central Coast, our library branches um, had these flyers or had sign-up sheets available, as well as a box of this packets of seeds. And when people signed up, they received um, the seed. Uh, then they went on the mailing list uh, that, <laughs> excuse me, that I would be sending out. We also signed up people through our mailing list and uh, event tables. Over 50 people signed up, and each person received 22 Cherokee Trail of Tears organic beans purchased from uh, Seed Savers Exchange in Iowa in a 10-pound bag, but that was way too much for 50 people. Um, 22 seeds. 20 seeds is genetic preservation, and I added two seeds for in case there were two that didn't germinate properly. Who signed up to participate? Very exciting. One Cool Earth, an elementary school garden education. 4-H, another 5 to 12-year-old gardening education. Uh, all ages of seed savers and gardeners. Uh, two libraries were signed on to the project. Uh, friends of ours, family members, a farm stand employee, um, who grew for the uh, organic farm and and right and supporters of the idea who just wanted to connect with the project, and there were certainly people that weren't successful growing, but they all liked being connected with the project. This is one of our libraries. Heidi planted her beans out and back next to the parking lot uh, on that wonderful string trellis and uh, put the poster up next to it. She took pictures during the summer over the growing season and those plants completely covered that uh, in a very lush, lush um, production. It produces uh, many green seeds, many is a very productive plant. Um, she did some green to eat and then let the rest go dry. And the plant, when it was fully dry and all the pods were fully dry, she harvested those and took pictures of the whole thing and created a storyboard for the library. These are some of our individual participants, their, their bean crop. Uh, you can see it's very, very uh, wants to grow, that's for sure. This is Hazel's bean teepee. Um, they, these folks ate every one of their green beans and they didn't have any um, dry beans to send back to the seed commons, but they were part of the project and a valuable part of the project. One Cool Earth, same thing. They didn't send any of their seeds back to the commons. Um, they grew them on corn plants as trellis. They harvested when dry, and then they cooked them and ate them as hummus, all of them. <laughs> Here's Eileen, our farm stand employee. Um, she's growing as a farmer for the very first time. She asked for a half pound of seed. She had a, a bean grower mentor at that farm, and uh, she did a great job. She got many, many pounds of seeds out of it. And she uh, put them in five uh, half pound bags uh, with a label she designed for One Seed, One Community and uh, sold, sold out at the farm stand within two weeks. In October, we met for a seed exchange uh, to celebrate the project and mix our beans all together. I love growing corn, so I stuck this picture in. Uh, here's some shots from that event. Um, uh, some people brought in their bean pods that were still ready to be harvested. And that's Thea up there in that left-hand corner, uh, finishing up her seeds. 
The 4-H kids helped with that, anybody that wasn't finished harvesting. Other people mailed their seeds in um, and or brought them to the event. And they were advised to send just what they wanted to send. So, so the 4-H, they had a huge crop, but they sent back just pretty much what they received in the beginning. And uh, some people sent if they had one plant and they only had a couple pods that did well, they sent us a few. Some people sent us half pounds or more. And so um, it was a, a big mix and, and whatever people wanted to send back in for the seed commons was welcome. The right hand one, we had a little scale there and we weighed each contribution in as it came in. Uh, that's Carrie doing that work. And she made a log of how much, how much each one weighed. And then it went into the big black pot that Francis is fondling. Here's what that pot looked like looking down into it. We collected 15.3 pounds of dry beans and um, probably would have been much more if the, those, the, some of the projects hadn't eaten all their green beans. And we were ready to distribute these mixed beans. We also, if anything didn't look very good, we, we made sure it didn't go into the big pot but there was hardly any, they, most of them just looked beautiful like this, so shiny and, and ready to go. The 4-H gardeners also um, provided food for our hospitality table, making black bean brownies, black bean salsa, black bean salad um, for dips and stuff, zero waste with service. And the repackaging is on the right there. That is um, the big pot. And um, we had provided uh, the new 2020 seed labels on the packets ready to be filled with uh, 22 seeds each. And the 2020 One Seed One community, we decided to call it adaptation for regrowing the seeds we had mixed together and uh, bringing in a new seed for diversity. And the new seed was Jacob's cattle, a bush bean, uh, originating in the far uh, northeastern US. We, uh, yeah, so then COVID-19 shut down and all of our lives in this country and all over the world changed, shifted, um, started to approach life a little differently. So we decided not to offer an outside tutorial for this year for diversity and adaptation, but we discussed the issues uh, that came up among ourselves. And since it was the second year, participants were feeling more comfortable, will, willing to uh, speak to each other, to share photos and stories about what was happening. And questions came up, we researched. Um, when harvest time came, we were not able to meet, so everyone was advised to save some seeds and eat the rest. Uh, these are a few of the 2020 participants. Uh, on the left, Jacob's cattle, uh, middle, Silvio with her beautiful Cherokees, and Jeannie on the right with her Cherokee Trail of Tears beans. 4-H uh, project grew both and uh, they decided to measure their harvests. And on the right is Carol's basket of uh, Jacob's cattle. In 2020, we went on a new path, some of us. Um, uh, research scientists from U University of California in Santa Barbara decided to do a three-year study on um, gardener safe kidney beans. And she selected uh, or invited individuals from all geographic areas of California, which there are a number, and um, those of us who ended up finishing the project or going all the way through the three years um, are mostly co are all coastal, I should say. Um, 
We receive 20 to 30 red kidney beans from six geographic areas around the world. And I took 20 seeds to start that project. There are a couple of pictures. Uh, on the right, is, kidney beans are also bush bean. On the right was the most productive plant in this group, um, number five. And I learned about bean beetles from that plant. And we shared that information. And that led to our common practice of freezing all our harvested beans in uh, double Ziplocs for a week or two. Couple more pictures. Here is my final harvest, last harvest. And you can see the different plants, uh, individual plants produced very differently. Some a lot and some very little. Um, I make lots of notes and little maps and stuff. Another project we decided on was tomato tasting. We, from that experience, we decided to grow as a group Berkeley tie-dye pinks to compare taste to flavor and texture. Um, also, soybeans, we have both, you know, Peruvian and um, uh, Japanese members of our, our group that have done the project. 1C1 community project and decided to include edamame. So we brought in 11 varieties of edamame uh, to grow out as a group. Online tutorials are available. They're just all over the place. This was a fantastic one for our soybeans. Kristen Leach at Second Generation Seeds, um, wonderful tutorial. So new paths in 2023, um, using that 1C1 community model, how will your community promote seed and food security? Diversity and resilience depend on people doing things differently in different soils at different latitudes with different attitudes, all supports biodiversity. That's my quote. This is us at uh, Central Coast Bioneers conference table on the left and on the right, uh, Santa Barbara Seed Swap. One seed, one community, grow a row. Thanks for being here today, everybody. Awesome, thank you for sharing that, Elizabeth. I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna share my screen now. To stop the other screen share. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk about what we've done in the the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um. So we've done a number of we've we've had a lot of different iterations. <laughs> So I'll kind of talk to you about what we've done and some of the things that we've worked that have worked. Some of the things we're like, yeah, that wasn't super successful. Um, and if you happen to be in the this area, you know, we encourage people that live in this area to donate to the uh, Sogorea Tayland Trust, which helps to rematriate the indigenous people in this area. So we started um, with Painted Pony, and as Elizabeth mentioned, it's picking we've we've decided to go with beans mostly because it's super satisfying for people so people that are new to seed saving when you get your hands into like a pile of freshly shelled beans there's something that's just kind of reawakens in you and it's magical and exciting to kind of just run your fingers through through the beans so we had decided to pick the painted pony which is a gorgeous bean it's also dual purpose so it can be eaten as a green bean. It can also be eaten as a soup bean. So we, you know, based on the size of population, you know, the, how much people grow, growing a soup bean tends not to be what we've focused on because you people only get a cup of beans and that's like a meal. And so they're not as likely to share stuff back and maybe turned off to seed saving because it's, you know, they're like, that was a lot of work and I got one meal out of it. Whereas if it's green beans, they're eating it throughout the season and then they're able to save some. And if they have a little bit extra, they can make soup out of it. So that was kind of our thinking in um, selections and just in terms of a general trend that we've had pretty beans, dual purpose, or green beans. 
So when we first, uh, one of our first ones was we did a collaborative project with Richmond Grows, the Berkeley Ecology Center, and with the University of California Agricultural and Natural Resources. And they were the ones that picked up the, um, the UCANR were the people that picked up the tab for it. So they chipped in some money to pay for the bean seeds. And I believe basil also, which is the Berkeley Ecology Center, which is the home of the first, you know, kind of modern kind of seed library. Um, they also pitched in some money to kind of get supplies for us as well. And we gave that out mostly at events. So that was a way we like the seed swaps and, um, you know, kind of tabling different events. So that's kind of how we got it out. And we had a, we had gone with this idea of, you know, some people have different amounts of spaces. So we had a care to share, which is 20, 20 seeds in a pot, in a packet with the idea that hopefully maybe people would save some and maybe give some to a neighbor. And if possible, save some, give some back to the seed library grow a row, which was more of an extensive, like I have a plot, I'm able to kind of do a little bit more, give it back to the community. And then the bed of beans, which are people that were kind of larger growers. Um, I don't know if I would recommend that. It was a lot of extra packaging and just the size, you know, like how many people signed up for different things. We, you know, didn't necessarily calculate that right. But, but where we did get most of our beans back were from the people that were the larger growers. So that's kind of a nice thing to know that if you really want to kind of get a bunch of seeds back, you might want to reach out to some specific people that have larger spaces. Um, and if you're really focused on the community building, obviously just getting, you know, multiple neighbors out is, is the way to go. The following year, or actually that same year, but in the fall, we did a P. So we had this really pretty uh, golden colored sweet pea. It's a terrible name because it's actually an edible pea. It's not a sweet pea but it's, it was a yellow potted uh, snow pea. Uh, and, and then we've done the great, great Aunt Rosie Italian pole bean, which is one that I got from my neighbor and he's been growing it in his family. It's his, his um, wife's family's um, being that they passed down and great, great Aunt Rosie was his wife's great, great aunt. So that's kind of like a local one that we, we've been sharing that's super productive and delicious and, you know, green bean, shelling bean, soup bean. So really um, a nice one to kind of um, to share in the community. And this year we're doing it again as a collaborative project through the East Bay, which is kind of a kind of a multi-county um, piece. And we're doing the provider bush bean this year. And I'm also doing one at my school. So I'm doing one at my school and I'm gonna do the painted pony at my school. Um, so what are kind of some suggestions? So pick a crop that's easy to grow and easy to save. So like I said, peas are, I'm sorry, beans are really good for the spring and summer. Um, peas and favas, favas do cross pollinate, but if people are only growing one variety, that works. And also fava beans are just beautiful and feed the soil. I mean, as do all those legumes. Um, bean suggestions, as I said, pick something that is either a green bean or a dual purpose. And you can do other species, it's totally fine. Um, Michigan, and hopefully during, we're going to have a series of these classes. So maybe later on, we'll have some from Michigan and they've done a number of different species. Um, so we can kind of bring that in a little bit later in the project, but maybe as a starting one, getting people excited because they're, it's very tactile to be able to hold the bean seeds and see it. Whereas if you're getting lettuce, which is great, um, you know, one or two people can probably grow enough lettuce for a community. So um, it, they're super productive. You know, so having a whole community growing something like that can be can be a lot of seed that you get back, which is great. Um, and also, if you can find something that, like I said, has a, has a some type of local significance, for example, the great great Aunt Rosie's Italian pole bean, those are nice um, pieces to bring in. And then what we've noticed is personal connection really matters. So if you're able to have an in-person event and you're able to give seeds to someone and have a conversation, they're gonna feel more connected to you and part of that community. So that's something that has been super helpful. What we've also noticed is that, you know, you might give a whole bunch of seeds to people and not that many people return, but the people that do step over that threshold to become a seed saver, like their identity changes. They're now a seed saver and they'll expand out to different species and different varieties. And so that's a really nice thing is that once you get people 
to step over that threshold and save something, then they're kind of like, they're part of like team seat saver. Uh, and lastly, calendar reminders. So I'll talk a little bit more about that, but what we've often done and where we, our program has fallen short is we've sent out the seeds, got people to sign up and then haven't been so good about following up with them. And so maybe they saved stuff or maybe they didn't know how to and they never got the email when they needed to to remind them to let them dry on the plant. And then they just ate everything. So um, reminders, reminders, reminders. And if you kind of get some momentum on this program, one thing you can think about is like, we're going to grow this this year. And what do we want to grow next year? So you can kind of be connecting maybe with some local growers now to ask them, would you be willing to save, you know, plant this one out and we're willing to buy the seeds from you? Um, or if it's, you know, like a larger thing, like a hort department, maybe they'll grow it out for free for you. So, but maybe thinking down the road, can you get some locally grown seed as well? Um, once you kind of have decided on your plant that you're going to do, you know, you want to get all your supplies together. We originally did glue and it was, you know, like everything's gluey and all over the place. So staples, we just had printed out labels. Oh, actually I have some right here. Oh, what do you know? Um, so we just, I just, you know, printed out, I mean, you could do bigger, but I just do, you know, this, I have a paper cutter cause I'm a teacher and we just stapled them on the packet and it it made it significantly faster and we didn't have to let things dry and not get glued together. And you also want to think about when you're packing stuff up, you know, you're not counting or hopefully you're not counting out 20 beans each. It's really like, here's a rough approximation. So you count out your 20 or, or your 22, whatever your number you're kind of giving. And you're like, okay, that's what it looks like in my palm or here's a scooper. And that's what it looks like in the scooper. So you're, you're, you know, you're able to be fairly quick about it. Cause I mean, it depends on the volume that you're doing, but we've done it, you know, when we're doing it multi-county wide, you know, we're buying, you know, five, 10, 15 pounds of bags. If we're, if we're, and that's a lot to be counting out, you know, 10,000, 20,000 seats. Um, and then I would recommend having a way, having a Google form to collect information. We've definitely, we definitely have spreadsheets. I mean, not spreadsheets, but just like sign up sheets when we go to events. But I can say one, it's a lot of extra work to type it in. And I pro probably 40 to 50% of the names, I can't read their emails and they bounce back. So it's one supports your volunteer staff to have either have a QR code and like a tiny URL with that's linked to a form. And I'll give you samples of the forms at the end. So you have something to kind of go with. Um, and then make it a work party, like get people together. I'm also a teacher. So I have access to people that need to do community service that, uh, that always, that always is a nice piece. Um, if you've got that, those that available to you. Um, access. So uh, kind of as we've gone through this, we're trying to increase how can we make the information more accessible and the project more accessible to more people. So you can think about what languages um, and what tools um, people need to access information. So we have our information translated into Spanish and English. Uh, so our Google form is in Spanish and English. Our packets, we have Spanish packets we have, because it's a lot of information. So we have Spanish packets, we have English packets. Um, and then some people, you know, only have phones, they don't have computers. And so, and they pretty much just use text messages, they don't use emails. So we this year have decided to go and ask people, do you want an email? Do you want a text or is either fine? And so we've definitely got some people this year that have said text only. And some people prefer information one way or the other. So um, I think trying to kind of meet people where they're at um, is hopefully going to help us out. And, you know, we're also thinking about like visual because some people are, you know, very visual learners. You know, we haven't got those resources built that yet, but just, you know, what does it look like when you're giving them the information to being like, this is what the planting looks like. So having some visual of that, um, as well as, you know, people in our community have varying levels of literacy. So wanting to make it more accessible to people, um, you know, where English might not be, they might be multilingual, you know, they're and their language skills, um, written write, reading skills may not be um, well-developed. And yes, and so if you have any ideas about accessibility, it'd be great to see people put things. So if you have other ideas about how that might look in terms of increasing accessibility, that would be great to see other people's ideas about that. So this was just some of the things we did because 
we want to kind of think about how can we like Elizabeth and I are just are just sharing our journey, but it is not the only journey. And, you know, you might have an amazing solution that really supports other people that are doing in other communities that are doing this project. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay. Um, okay, so getting out the word. So we, during the pandemic, we, you know, obviously we're not doing, I mean, the library was shut down for quite some time. Uh, we still did the One Seed One Community project, but it was pretty much, we had 13 seed libraries that were just distributed in the community. We had them on boxes, on, I mean, literally just cardboard boxes stuck on, you know, fences at churches and in uh, grocery stores. And we had, you know, the sign up sheet and a QR code, but all the seeds got taken, but we got like one or two people signed up. So um self-serve it's nice for access but not really for building that community piece and walking people through so once again people that do sign up what we're you know what we're kind of saying is we're going to give you emails throughout the season that are going to help you figure out like when do I plant how do I plant oh I'm noticing this in my garden right now you know like oh, I've got bean weevils or whatever I've got this or it's time to eat like here are some recipes so trying to figure out what are some points throughout the growing season to help them out. So hence the reason getting them to sign up is kind of kind of connect, creating the community, but also creating um, the access to those resources that they may need to go all the way from seed to seed. And as you can see, Elizabeth had a number of um, images that people posted on social, you know, just shared with her, but also like getting people to, you know, post on social media to kind of build some awareness about, you know, seed saving and seed practices would be great. We're also doing a project called the Million Seed Savers Campaign and kind of like I see the future. So if people want to like take a photo of their beans in their hands with a like I see the future because and put that out on social media, that would be that would be super, super lovely. Um, and we really good to have a couple dedicated volunteers who are sending out the emails throughout the season. So what happened with us is, you know, we had someone who was supposed you know, sending out the emails but like we just needed to like get the calendar reminders on, which is like, we're going to send one out in early April. We're going to send one out in mid-May. We're going to send one out in June. And so having it as a calendar reminder that gives you like an email that says, hey, it's now time to do this um, and making it an annual event so that next year you're, you know, you're already synced up and it's already done for you kind of from here on out. And I'm trying to think about like languaging and this is something we can, you know, do throughout the season. And we are going to have this online forum if you want to participate in it. But just like what what kind of inspires people to kind of, you know, join and, and sign up. So for example, we have this One Seed One community. We provide the seeds. You provide the love. You know, like now we're using kind of more like be a seed hero. But we're, you know, if you have ideas, if you've done a One Seed One community and you have any language or you like to kind of come up with, um, slogans or really like that, we'd love to hear your thoughts about some things that people might, you know, get inspired by um, to kind of want to sign up. Um, and then lastly, I'm, you know, because a lot of people are visual learners and maybe, you know, they might see a, a handout about One Seed One Community, but it doesn't necessarily connect with them. So I created a little video last night or two nights ago and I have not gotten the Spanish checked over by my Spanish tutor. So like, you know, if you are, um, you know, fluent, you know, um, please know that the corrections will be made later on tonight. So we're going to watch a little video. It's super short. So once again, we're going to, the idea with this video is to kind of share it out as we're starting to do the One Seed One community. So that people know that it exists, they know where to get the seeds and also open to any other ideas um, you have about um, the video, if it works for you or it doesn't work for you. Oopsie. Okay, here we go.
So that is that one. Um, great. And then at this point, um, so we are going to share a document. So like Sue, um, can you share the document with um, people in the, I don't know if we would just go to, want to go to uh, general questions first. Maybe we'll go to general questions first. So does anyone have any general kind of questions that they have um, for Elizabeth and I? So we'll just kind of maybe do, and let me, before we do that, um, so you can put the questions in the chat. I don't know if there's a, if people want to do more of like, we can just do it in the chat instead of so the Q&A. Um, but before we do that, I just want to kind of go over just kind of some that, you know, we just have a role. So this is kind of just the languaging we're using around this, which is like, we have a role in tending to the space. Um, during this kind of skill share, we agree to speak for ourselves and make space for others, be as present as possible, be aware of who is missing in each conversation. Remember that no one has a monopoly on truth and everyone's experience is valid. So once again, this is just Elizabeth and I, our perspective of what we've done. It's not the only way to do it. You know, and obviously we're also open to hearing your perspectives and what you've done and, and your pathway. Um, you know, critique ideas, not people, listen to our bodies and tend to their needs, give some grace for technical and logistical difficulties. Hopefully we haven't had to any, any yet. <laughs> Aim for connection and not perfection. Um, avoid slang. And um, uh as some people and sub participants may be multilingual and English is not their home language. Um, so how seeds, so, so I see a question there. So um, not sure if I missed this, how many seeds do you suggest to be returned? Elizabeth, I think you answered that somewhat, but go ahead. Um, we suggested, can you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, we suggested that you try to return what you received. So if, if at minimum, so if you receive 22 seeds, try to return that as a gesture to the seed comments. But some people were very um, eager to do a big crop and to give all that back to the seed commons. And some people, like I said, had um, uh, crop failures. And so they maybe only got a few plants and so they gave us a little sample of what they did grow. And that felt just as important as the big donation um, is just to have a part of everyone who participated come back into the common uh, seed commons. Yeah, and I think it also depends on what you're really looking to, 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 to kind of create with the program. If you're trying to create seed savers, it if they just get like, you know, like, and I've seen some one seed, one community, which is like, just give us three bean, po bean seed, bean pods back, you know, um, which would be kind of like the equivalent of like the 20, what you got from us is what you'd give back. We don't really have any, we can also just say, sure. Like for us, we're just like, you can also share it with a neighbor. You know, we just want people to like, think about how do you save seeds and that you can do it, that you've got the agency to do it. And then even if you're just saving it for yourself, then you've, you're a little bit more self-sufficient for next year. And like Elizabeth said, you know, the couple of bigger growers that we have had have given us, you know, like jars, which is like, okay, we, we've, we have enough to go for next time because of, you know, one or two people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's no, there's no thing. Okay. So let's see what is something. Um, but I do like the idea of like the party at the end, which I did not really emphasize. And we're going to do it this year. So what we're going to talk about our, our group, we have like five people on our committee that are are doing the one seed one community. Oh no, this is the grow out program. Sorry, a grow out program. We've got a lot of people doing the one seed one community, but um, we're gonna have like a big like celebration at the end where people can bring their beans and like harvest them just like Elizabeth did, and that's a nice way. Um, but freeze at the end, freeze because people have had issues where they pulled everything together and one pe person brings in bean weevils and then they go to like give the seeds out the next year and everything's gone. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, let's see, so, since some diseases sometimes can be in the soil spread to the plant seeds. Um, and it, uh, so that's that one question about, um, uh, diseases spread. It really like some, some species are spread more by seed and others are more like beans are not really as spread. 
like it's more like beam weevils that you'd be concerned about. And I'm not sure about tepary. Tepary is like the one that's there's, you know, can can can, can infect that. What do you do you want to do you have any information on the the bean disease piece? Or just Me, in general? Um I I called when when I discovered the those bean uh beetles, um I talked to Steve Peters, um, who's a breeder for C Revolution now and so we talked about how to deal with that. But as far as as far as other diseases, um, if you can go to uh, an extension, um, a university extension, I know uh, uh, certainly Oregon State, um, New York State extension um, would have people to ask. So wherever you are, if you go to your university, or uh, agriculture extension people and ask them about uh, specific diseases that affect beans in your area or other plants. And we do, we do in the general um, seed saving guidelines is say only return from healthy plants. So that that's one of the pieces that we're trying to teach people. And so that that is definitely part of the messaging when the emails go out is like only save from healthy plants. So you're kind of telling the plants we want more of you. So if they have something that's diseased, one, as Elizabeth said, they could definitely check in with an extension agency, like what is it, but they should not be saving and returning those seeds to right. people. So um, that's something that you can, I suppose in the messaging that we can put in, we can put in like some boxes of like, only return them if they're healthy. You know? <laughs> like, so yes, thank you for asking that question. Um, I'm gonna make a little note that we kind of highlight that in our messaging because we have it in our general pieces, but. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you have any legal disclaimer about the fact that seeds are saved by individual growers and not commercially? Do you commingle seeds with commercially grown seeds in your library boxes? Um, we do have a disclaimer on at our seed library, and I can put the disclaimer um, in our like group, um, you know, whatever a group's IO if people want to join it. But basically says these seeds are grown by community members like we've done for tens of thousands of years and um, with love and, you know, their germination rates not, might not be the same. Sometimes things might be, you know, different from described. And we tend not to commingle commercially grown seeds, but we do mix for genetic diversity within the community. Like Elizabeth said, they, they put them all in one pot to, to have the. I, the, I have a little comment, too, on that. Um, our our library uh, decided to treat that as um, uh, they've made a special label that is a patron uh, seed label, so it goes in a separate label from the the standard library label that uses all commercial seed. Now they purchase their own seed, and then all the return seed has a different label, and so I thought that was the okay solution. Yeah, and our our seed library before the pandemic, we were one hundred percent locally grown. So right. um, everything, and we're not in the library catalog system. We're super just like self serve. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so self serve. So kind of the so the the uh, question from um, uh, Pam in there about like, so how do you get people to sign up? So right now we're really looking at. Um, you know, there's a number of community events. And so we're going to just have tables and, you know, we'll have some information about the seed library, but really trying to get people to sign up specifically for the one seed, one community thing. So we're going to be like, so we have this beautiful, I have this big, beautiful poster for the one seed, one community. Um, and we're going to do it there. We have the, um, the seed swap that's in two weeks. So we'll have a table there. And then what we will probably do is ask the librarians at the, the reference desk to have the one seed community because we now have like 25 seed libraries in um, the East Bay. So we'll probably just have the seed librarians have it at, sorry, have the reference desk people have the box at their table. And so people can ask and they can explain it. And then I'm like, oh, I'll sign up for that. And then they can put their email there or whatever um, QR code or whatever. Um, would anyone else have a source for free non-hybrid seeds from a seed company that does not charge them? Um, so I, it, you can, are you just looking for just, uh, so if you're just looking for general seeds, I mean, you can ask for companies, but companies are just going to give you what they have um, 
so it's and if you're looking for one seed you might want to if it's a little bit harder to kind of get the volumes that you need if you're looking for if that's your question so um and then yeah the patent question is an is an issue as well so you're going to want to look on johnny's um, select seed also has a lot of patented seeds, not so much with beans, but a lot of their other stuff is patented, which is you know, if you see PVP or plant variety protection, you're allowed to save it for yourself, but you cannot share it. And so we do not want to be, um, and we want to respect plant breeders that are doing traditional work. And we also want to not get into any legal <laughs> issues. Um, but you, some, uh, to your question about getting, um, non-hybrid sources, not that everything is non-hybrid from this, but if you want to get a free, um, source, I would recommend checking out the co-op garden folks, wow. um, co-op garden network. Um, and you can be a seed hub and ask for seed. Oh, someone already put it in their pets. Bro. You're so on it. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Thanks, Pat. Um, where else were we? So now I got and lost my pace. Um, uh oh. Depending on the program uh, that you're doing, uh, um, uh, all our education programs are um, available for free seeds from seed companies. So uh, choose the companies that you like, what they do, who they are. How, what their company structure is, how they they treat their employees, <laughs> and and um, and ask for explain what your program is and ask for free seeds, and um, I always say organic. Yeah, yeah, and it's um, you know in terms of like the one seed one community project, you might you might not be getting what you want from right. that project because you might be getting just a bunch of individual packets of random stuff, and if you're trying to actually kind of focus on one thing you might it might not be that might not be the way to go for that um but you might you might check a co-op gardens and ask them like this is what we're specifically doing do you have any beans that you can just give us just beans and they're i think probably a little bit more amenable um and willing to kind of support you in that and you can do it for non-donation and other people will pitch in and pay extra for their seeds so it's fine um I have one uh, comment on that uh, uh, that we haven't said a whole lot about it, but I try to iterate often that it's it's kind of all about growing from the same seed source. So, you know, even if if everybody got a different packet from a different company of the same variety, that that isn't doing this project. So this project is intended to grow from the same seed source. So I just want to iterate that reiterate okay uh let's see um anything that saved i know it's a lot of okay seed Maybe. donation program they all have seed donation programs all of the all of the good companies do oopsie baker oopsie. creek hudson valley seed savers exchange other than that all of them Good. Thanks for putting that in. Okay. And and what Rebecca said is that you know when they end the year and they have seed unsold, they they want to sell their freshest seed to purchasers, and so um, most of the seed they give away might be from a year or two before. So. Yeah. Well, le legally, once it gets a date stamp on it, they have one year to sell it. So, oh, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's a legal thing that, um, you know, they've tested it during. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's legal and also probably just practical that it this doesn't make sense to like chop right. them off, stick them back in a container, and retest them later for germination rates. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's see. Um, so maybe at this point, because I'm not seeing a lot of other questions coming in. So maybe at this point, um, Sue, do you want to put in the um the great awesome so if people want to go to the chat if you're not already there there is a document um oh before you go there rebecca there, there, there is a comment about uh, the department of ag visiting one of the seed libraries and looking at the separate commercial and individual you want to address that um yeah sure and and could that person let me see where is that michelle mcintyre um, and so which uh, can you 
so so back what was it 2015 mm -hmm. so 2015 some people are aware that there was um an, an issue with um the department of ag person um visiting a seed library in pennsylvania and that caused like a major like flurry of of concern um and we spent there was a group of us um that met for probably a good year and a half two years well we met for at least two years and we met with the department of the there's a group called the american association of seed control officials um and we met we had a working we had a working um collaboration with them for two years with the American Association of Seed Control Officers, along with representatives from the uh, seed industry. And we, because they were concerned about that we were sharing seeds that weren't up to commercial stand standards, which of course they're not because we're not commercial, we're non-commercial, we're community-based. So we were able to explain how our work is different, what our offerings are different from what they do commercially. And we were able to come up with language that amended the recommended uniform state seed law, which is known as Russell, R-U-S-S-L, recommended uniform state seed law. So that is the recommendation that seed libraries and seed sharing that has been done in communities for 10,000 plus years is exempt from commercial requirements such as germ testing. We do recommend, as I said, and I will put it in the email out, a disclaimer just saying that this is not commercial. This is what we've been doing for 10,000s of years and I have, you know, quite successfully kept society, um, you know, fed. So if you, yeah, so if you do happen to um, have someone visit, you can, and once again, it's a recommend, it's a recommendation. So it, it, it helps in order for seeds going across borders for everyone to have the same, same understanding about seed law. And so, um, different st states when they adapt it they just you know they just adopt russell you know without making any amendments but most of the for the most part that that conversation has been um you know wrapped up okay um okay great oh hi hi kelly um that's kelly kelly ray uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Super. So at this point, maybe if people want to look at, and we'll keep looking at the the comments as they come in. But if people want to look at the, correct. Yeah. And so yeah. So once again, our our um, languaging says you know we intentionally do not share plant variety protection, genetically modified or or chemically treated um, seeds. So that is part of our languaging. And so once again, if people, if, uh, Sue, if you want to kind of share that document again. So if people want to go to that document and open it up, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think it was actually, we didn't actually have a lawsuit. We just, um, with the Duluth thing, it wasn't a lawsuit. It was just, they visited we had a conversation, we were able to explain our position and then we um, changed the law. So it wasn't a lawsuit. It was actually, we went in and we revised, we went in and got the law changed so that it's now on the books. Um, so what do you do with this document? So the idea with this document is, um, and I will go and I will open up the document. Okay. So let me kind of shrink my screen down. So I, I just, it's, it's, you know, I just feel like a lot of times when we're starting stuff off new, it's just nice to have kind of a template. And this is just a suggestion. Once again, you don't need to do it like that. Um, it's just, um, you know, this is just some things to think about or consider. So first off, you can see at the top, there is a thing which says we've created this online. So if, for those of you that don't know, we have the Seed Libraries Network, we have the Cool Beans, which is our newsletter, and you can sign up for that at seedlibraries.net. And then we also have what's called Upbeat, which is an online forum where you can ask questions, post resources, and kind of get support or share inspiration. And so under the Upbeat, what I've done is I've created a subgroup called One Seed, One Community. So if you want to 
um, follow along or like share ideas or ask for help or like, hey, I found a really great, I'm trying to find this particular bean. Has anyone, you know, knows of a good grower that's selling it organically for a decent price? Okay. So that would be a place where you could ask those questions and answer people's um, questions. So once again, that's here at this uh, 1C1 community subscribe, and then you need to actually let them know when you subscribe that you do, you, you were the one that, that subscribed. So just to confirm that. And so the questions I have is like, you're going through this process and like, as things come up, you're like, oh, I have a question about this, or this is something I need to just kind of be get in my mind. So first off, I was just thinking about like, know your why. So we're, we've all, we've all signed up for today for some reason or another. So like, what is, what are your reasons for, for being here? And that might help kind of focus your, your messaging to your community. So are you really focused on building community? Are you really just trying to get people to get their hands in the soil and to garden? You know, so then that might be more of your focus. Are you trying to increase the number of seed savers? So this is like a launching launching place for getting people to grow specific things for you so you can have more diversity in your collection. Um, are you trying to raise awareness of that there's a seed library and this is just one of your kind of promo pieces that you have out in the community? Are you trying to celebrate like a cultural connection? Like we had the great, great Aunt Rousey's Italian pole bean. You know, or are you trying to do something like creating climate resilient local beans? So this is just kind of like you you make a copy of this document, so then it's yours because you can't write on my document. And then you can just kind of like it's a checklist. So you can be like, that's important to me. Oh, actually, I made it as a cross off list. Oopsie daisy. <laughs> oh, well, there's different, <laughs> there's different ways to do it. There's the cross off and there's you go up here and you change it to the other type. So you can't actually see what I'm doing right there. So I did it up on top. There's the cross out and then there's the checklist. So I should have done that way. Great. So it's up here, checklist. So you can change your own so it's not crossing stuff out. Okay. And then, uh, and you can also down, download this too. So people ask, can you download it? So you can download it or just, um, yeah, you can do either way. And so like now when I do it, it checks it versus crosses it off. Sorry about that. I was not looking at the subtle, the small text. So if everyone wants, so it might be interesting to hear like for other people, like what, what is your reason for doing this? So let maybe give you like a minute or two, like what or is one, of, and you might have several of them checked out, but if you want to kind of just share in the chat, like what is your, like, what is your like top one or two from here? So if people want to put that in the chat, like why, what's your why for doing a one seed one community? And it might be something that's not on this list that I just in my brain didn't get. <laughs> Elizabeth, what about you? What is what's your what what was your number one? Or do you have a number one or two? Uh, number one, inc whoops, increase the number of seed savers and um skill building skill building for seed savers and anybody that's building seed saver skill usually has an interest in building community and if you have an interest in building community then you're interested in each other's gardens and and you want to eat together and you want to see what other people are planting so it it really ripples it ripples out um yeah, I mean, yeah, it's super, super good. I mean, like in our community, we we have a very strong gardening community. So like, we're not, you know, like, like for us, it's like building community and like getting people to actually learn how to save seeds because they're, they're growing the seeds. They're growing them. They're just not saving them. Yeah. And diversity is a really big one for me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. So people kind of have some sense of that one. And then the next thing is like, this is, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be a huge amount of work, but it is definitely work and it requires some time. So like the next piece is like, who might be available to support you? Like who is it library staff? Is it, you know, is it, um, do you have an organizing committee? Are there community volunteers that you can tap into? For example, like I said, I, I'm a teacher. I got like, I got tons of volunteers available. <laughs> Um, master gardeners, because they, you know, they need more hours for like teaching classes. So you maybe have a class that's associated with this. Um, 
you know, we have like an urban, um, we have like a hort to call, uh, horticulture department close by. So like they're able to kind of maybe grow next year's seeds for us. Um, and also some of the students in their department, like I'm reaching out to the department saying, hey, can I give you a pack? And, and can you ask some of your Hort students if they want to save some seeds? And maybe they're, you know, want to volunteer too. So I have one of the volunteer, one of my key volunteers is one of the Hort students. So kind of look through that list and see if there are some groups that maybe you want to partner with that maybe could, and you could put specific names down there about like, different groups that you think might want to be similarly missioned. Yeah. What were you thinking, Elizabeth? Oh, I have two comments on two of the groups there. Um, uh, our Master Gardeners program in our county does not support seed saving, which just always drove me crazy and still does. And um, now they, they're they contacting me to give away seeds at their annual event. And I'm like, you guys don't even support seed saving. What are you coming to me for? So um, it was great to work with Hilly. Hilly actually, uh, in her county, they actually are similar, but not as, not as bad about it as here. And she just went ahead. Uh, she just went ahead with her seed work and use the skills she learned as a master gardener to be an educator. So that was great. And the other comment about permaculture guilds is um, that I have not found one really good seed saver in the permaculture culture. Um, it's mostly about um, you know perennial plants and building food forest, and it's not about saving seeds. And um, so those are my two comments on that. Um, everybody, and, and, everybody else is great. I think it's interesting with the master gardeners because we similarly master gardeners did not both in where I work, which is another county and versus where I live was not very like 30 minutes. Um, so I went and I did the master gardener training for seed saving in Marin a couple of years ago. And then I did like a four hour, but it was like continuing education. So it was like four, no, it was like a six hour training that I did for their, their, their group. Um, and it was filled, it was packed. So that was the interest was there and that made when that happened and it was like the, like sold out, you know, whatever sold out free, but whatever. And um, it really inspired them to decide like maybe we can put a little bit more emphasis on this. And same thing, we as Richmond Grows, because we had so many master gardeners that were part of our organizing committee and they were doing a lot of our training on seed saving as, you know, we got our, what we did was we got our seed saving class uh, approved because one of the master gardeners went to the master gardener thing, got it approved as a master gardener class. So the master gardeners could one, take it for continuing education, but it's now also approved for them to teach it in the community mm. because we're actually like a program of them. So that was a nice, that's if you are struggling with kind of maybe engaging master gardeners or if you're a master gardener yourself, those are some ways to be like, can, can the master gardeners be one of the partners of the seed library and then that makes for a stronger bond and then that kind of builds that that awareness within the master gardener community and base so that's something to to think about um good okay um so any other any other kind of thought and yeah with the community right so i'm looking at the chat Build community, raise awareness, skill, restart our seed library, participate in community garden, raise awareness of seed library resource, raise awareness, create community, locally adapted seed, increase number of seed savers, all the above. <laughs> Get people in the habit of returning seeds. Thanks, Pat. <laughs> Teach seed saving to gain seed growers, save seed diversity, skill building. Yeah, great. Yeah. And just, yeah, trying to figure out, like, I, I was, you know, I looked up and, you know, you can obviously look up at it too, and hopefully we'll have some of these people coming in and, and in upcoming sessions is, you know, I've seen some interesting things with, um, you know, One Seed, One Community Project in Ontario that looked like it was a nature center with, you know, a seed library with, so it was like this multi-pronged, you know, 
sustainable organization. So you could look at, you know, that might be another thing that we just add in so that you might have a local, um, you know, climate adaptation, you know, or sustainability group. So I'm just adding this onto my list as someone who might be interested in, you know, being partnering if you want to have like a couple people. And that's nice because they have a different membership or maybe some crossover, but there's, there's other people that they can reach out to in their thing. Okay. I would love to create a seed source that is local. Yes, that sounds great. Um, Thanks for all your comments. Really wonderful. It's nice to see what people are saying. Um, and so let's just kind of look at the next kind of like, this was kind of the place where we're going to kind of, and, and you do not need to do a bean. Okay. So like I said, you do not need to do a bean. Elizabeth and I have done beans. Um, like I said, for tactile purposes and just, it feels really satisfying when you have beans and provides a lot of food. So that was kind of some of our thinking behind them. And it's also a, what we call in the seed saving world, super easy to save. So that's something when you're looking at the lens of what do you want to pick because beans are extremely self-pollinating. It doesn't require it. These are what we, we would call super easy plants to save so that any beginner who has no seed saving experience can save them, plant them the next year, and then they're going to get something that comes out like what they planted originally. So it's, um, that's one of the reasons why we, we chose that because it's easy to grow and easy to save reliably. Um, once again, if you if your community or you're super focused on another species, by all means, do what feels right to you. Um, but this was kind of what we were looking at, like just in terms of like what is important to you. So you're going to be, you know, if you decide to go through this this project, like what what's important to you? What are you going to be um, selecting a bean on what criteria? Does it should it be locally grown or is it fine that next year when you if you share it out again, it's now going to be locally grown. Um, is it something that's culturally relevant? So Oakland Museum, um, sorry, Oakland um, Public Library, they've been doing a lot of really wonderful work in the community. They have this amazing grant right now where they've got a large, um, you know, large community of um, Asian, uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, and they've been offering these great seed packets, multilingual with book connections, with recipes and all that stuff. So, you know, maybe there's some group that you want to uplift in your community. So maybe cultural relevance is super important. Um, maybe it's something that has an interesting story that people can, can get um, inspired by. Maybe you're like, we would just really need to grow a lot of food. So productivity might be the, the main thing. Um, as I said, we like the dual purpose beans um, or at least a, a green bean, but dual purpose is kind of the place with the way we've gone. And you have to have to think about like uh, what, if you're getting a bean, like thinking about is this bush habitat, which is going to be less productive, but everyone's probably going to have access to growing it. Whereas if you have a pole bean, people are going to need something to grow it on, which requires an extra, you know, you either need a pole, you need a fence. So that might be less available, but it's also more productive. So thinking about what you want to do. And then, you know, does do is your area specifically blighted with something? So you want to have something that's super healthy and disease resistant or drought resistant, flavor, beauty, organically grown. One thing that my seed teacher said about the organically grown is it is from his perspective, which I share that perspective for this particular thing is it is better to buy something that's not organically grown from a smaller grower and support the smaller grower as well as it's unusual than buying something that's organic, but is, you know, is not in any risk of extinction or so, so that's just something to think about. And once you grow it organically, it will be grown organically from then on. So that's something to think about. So just want to, you might want to think about that list. Um, some things to kind of note on here is the, um, like, don't start with hybrids. If you are trying to get something that you want to come out the same every year. So it will, it will specifically say hybrid or F1, which stands for filial one generation. So if it says hybrid, that's not what you're going to be starting with. Um, and then as noted, there's a couple of companies, uh, Johnny's and someone else said high mowing. I wasn't as aware of them, but they um, do do a lot of plant breeding. At least Johnny's does a lot of plant breeding in their company. And so they have a lot of plant, um, uh, plant variety protection 
going on. Oops, I forgot the word variety. Um, and so on the Johnny's packet, you can click on and you'll see this. Okay, this is for lettuce here, but you can see that it's, it's and so what the thing to note is that you can get something that's open pollinated, you can get something that's organic, but it's got a plant variety protection. So you have to look for that, that specifically. Yeah. And disease free once again, being don't buy. So for example, don't buy beans in the store, the supermarket sold for food, thinking you're going to use that as your one seed one community because it's cheaper than buying it from a grower because there are there is a nasty bean variety uh, virus that's in in Mexico, and we wouldn't want to bring that up into the United States um, because it wasn't grown for that and it, it contained that virus. So uh, once again, using using seed that has been grown by a, a grower. And then from there, you can kind of grow within your community. Okay. Um, hold on, what's, what's going on? Uh, are there any bad ideas for um, crops and species choices? I, you know, I, it, I think it depends on where you live. I mean, certain things that are very hard to grow. Yes, I would say there's certain things. So certain things that are hard to grow are things like carrots. I would say anything that's like a root, root crops are going to be hard for probably a couple of reasons. One, carrots and beets require overwintering. So you have to keep them in the ground. And not only that, but carrots, the population size is like 50 and also when it goes to seed, it's not edible anymore. So it's different when you do something like lettuce where I can eat, I can plant lettuce, I can eat the lettuce and then at the end of the season, let it bolt. But if it's a carrot, it's gonna be in the ground. It has to go over winter. By the time that goes to seed, that carrot is not edible anymore. And I need a population of 50. So that's a lot of space and time for no food for people to get. So like that, that and beets, beet and charge are the same species um, and they both need to be overwintered. Um, oh, hold on, I'm seeing something with it. Say, was the art file showing the two hands that was used? Um, no, you can use it. I mean, basically, it's the two the the hands on the front of the slide, and I can I can add that into the link. Um, that was designed for our East Bay project, but then we adopted it. But uh, I'll ask my friend who the the artist donated and said like use it widely, but. I will just remind my friend to let him know that, you know, he might see his artwork around town <laughs> or around the world <laughs> to be. And then also, yes, Queen Anne's lace is also, um, if, if Queen Anne's lace is around, it's it's the same species as, as carrots. Um, and then it's kind of some other things like call anything that's a brassica oleracea. Um, so it, yeah, uh, corn wind pollinated. So that's going to be like everything. Can be so brassica oleracea. Um, in terms of this, is the species that are not oleracea. Um, so anything that's a brassica oleracea, so that's a scientific name for broccoli, cauliflower, kale, kohlrabi, cabbage. There's seven of them, okay, that are all the same species. So if you are growing any variety, if you're growing two varieties of broccoli. If you're growing a, a variety of broccoli and kale and either of them go to seed, they would cross pollinate. Um, but then again, you also have to think about like what, like for example, right now, I we're doing a lot more of genetically diverse crops. So like I have a, just basically a kale collard mix and it's a mix. So we're planting things like the kale coalition, which is like a mix of, you know, 15 different varieties of kale. And so that's also another way to go is, for some of these crops that are harder is just being like, we're open to the genetic diversity, but it's really about labeling. And that's why we really encourage seed libraries to have labeling and on your labels, you can say, this is a genetic mix. This we're, we're saving collards, but it's a mix of lots of different collards, um, you know, that we love. Um, any good sources on sheet sheets of population? Yeah, so, um, so population sizes. So on seedlibraries.net, we have, I think under how to start a seed library or save, maintain a seed library, we have population sizes. 
Um, it's something that that Seed Matters did in collaboration with um, Seed Savers Exchange. Um, but I will also post that like in my my email to people at the end. I'll post it and then I'll put it on the resources population list. Okay. And I am seeing we are kind of getting close to time. So I want to respect people's time. So um um to, 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 Sue, could you be kind enough to put in the feedback? So we'd love to hear your feedback about how today's session went. Um if you're kind of interested in uh, meeting with us again, I'll send out an email probably in, it's gonna be in the next month that we'll meet again. Um, and hopefully by that point, um, if you are hoping to do it this season, you will have gotten to the point where you've selected a bean. So hopefully you've got to the the section two, um, maybe even made some steps to trying to figure out like where you're gonna get the bean. So uh, once again, if you could look at the um, da -da -da, the form and fill that in and let us know how that goes, that would be great. Yes, and so Julie mentioned about um, land races, modern land races. So um, a lot of things to be more genetically diverse, but once again, it's really about um, mm -hmm. communicating that information and then also letting people like know what to expect that like this is genetically diverse and also really honoring the fact that a lot of seeds are really senses of a comfort and identity for people. So also, you know, really wanting to respect that there's a lot of seeds that we want to preserve and honor those traditions. So there's kind of kind of different ways to kind of approach this depending on your community and your community's needs. Great. Any last um, kind of thoughts there, Miss Elizabeth? Oh, last thoughts? No, really great. You know, from the comments, I, you're, you're all just really alert, ready to go with this project. I can see it read it so um i hope i hope a number of you um uh sign on to the group and uh uh come to the next month's session and let's keep talking about things and each of you will be a force in your communities i can see that and, and once again if you're interested um in joining kind of our online conversation um you can subscribe to the um, kind of listserv and that'll be a way to kind of keep in touch as we go through this process. Because together, once again, it's we're, we're doing it in a community, <laughs> like and hearing from what you're learning and your struggles will make it stronger for everybody. Good. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so uh, once again, um, look for, we'll send out the recording shortly and then we will, um, I'll put in some of the resources that people asked about the disclaimer um, checking about the hands and give you the information on the population things, but then hopefully also we'll see you on the online forum between here and our next meeting. And once again, I also want to thank um, Sue and Kelly for helping out in the chat and nice to see some familiar people and get to know some new people. And the next, the next session is going to be different. We'll have a, we'll have another presenter. So, um, so I'll be kind of co-hosting with another presenter. So we'll have another perspective on the program and then we'll have time for breakout rooms. So the idea is that the next time, if you're interested, we're hoping to kind of put you in kind of stable groups that you can kind of go through the process and have like five to eight people that you can kind of communicate with regularly, um, you know, besides the larger form. So hopefully that's um, kind of a process that works for supporting you in a way that's helpful. Okay, doke, we'll have a wonderful, wonderful day. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for doing this in your community. And we look forward to what you do and hearing from you soon. Okay, take care. And I'm going to learn how to stop recording. There we go. Stop recording.